The Denver Broncos have reportedly reached out to veteran quarterback Ryan Fitzpatrick, but is he the best option for this team, especially considering who might be available as we get further into this fascinating offseason? We're discussing that and a whole lot more from the latest edition of Broncos Beat. Hello, everyone. I'm Alexis Perry, joined tonight by Cecil Lammy from 104.3 The Fan, Andrew Mason from DNVR, and for the first time, the guy with arguably the best shoe collection out of all of us, Nick Cosmiter from The Athletic. Nick, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here, but I think Cecil probably has something to say about that. <laughs> we can debate that, but we only got a half an hour today. Well, let's kick things off, pun intended there, with the latest rumblings regarding Ryan Fitzpatrick. Guys, Woody Page tweeted out that the Broncos have made contact with the 16-year veteran, but with the start of free agency still a couple of weeks away, obviously nothing has come of it. So do you guys feel like Ryan Fitzpatrick is someone George Payton should pursue heavily once the floodgates open here on March 17th? His greatest upside, I think, for the Broncos is that you look at the way he plays, and he uh, does so with a lot of verve, a lot of swagger, and he's going to take some risks. He has some similarities with Drew Locke, and uh, he's proven to be a terrific mentor over the course of his career. We saw that in Miami with Tua Tungo Vailoa, and he also... If he's not the starter, he handles it very well. These are all key things, I think, when you're looking for somebody who can come in and provide competition. And if he's not starting, be a mentor and a sounding board for Drew Locke. So while there is no perfect candidate to be that guy, if this is the type of direction the and wish the Broncos go, Fitzpatrick checks an awful lot of the boxes and he might fit. Well, and he can win games. Let's be honest, guys. Nobody on this staff has time to start 0-4 or 2-6 or whatever that number is. Ryan Fitzpatrick, if he's starting, he's going to give you a pretty good chance to win. And if he's not starting, as Mace alludes to, uh, he's a guy that can go back there and help Drew Locke, help him understand things and help him understand, you know, what the defensive concepts he's seeing out there on the field. And Fitzpatrick can actually push Drew Locke. We can all go on and on about the positives of Drew Locke. There are several. Uh, we can go on and on about the negatives of Drew Locke. And Nick, we can talk about those picks, right? He's got to cut those down. But Ryan Fitzpatrick will actually push Drew Locke to be better. And I see that as nothing but a good thing for the Broncos. We saw it when the Dolphins came to Denver last season. And the Denver defense had really bottled up Tonga Valoa for, for most of the afternoon. The Dolphins put in Fitzpatrick in the fourth quarter, and he almost gets them all back. Doorstep of the end zone to potentially tie the game. Uh, luckily for Denver, Justin Simmons comes up with the interception. But you just sort of see that that you mentioned that he could push Drew Locke to be the starter. Um, he, he's a he's a backup, as Mace mentioned, who is, is really beloved in the building by teammates throughout, can be that mentor. Uh, but also, you know, you have this pinch hit situation. Now, I think it'd be a little bit different if you were with the Broncos and you are um, coming in to replace a guy like Drew Locke, like in the middle of games, uh, it, it's not like you can just turn and go back to to Tua like they did last year. Like if you're coming in and you're replacing Drew Locke, it, it's probably meaning that that's going to be more of a permanent situation. Um, you know, the only thing that concerns me a little bit is, you know, is his age. Uh, he, he's, he's up there, but we saw last season that he, uh, continue to have it in, in terms of being able to, you know, come back late in games, week 16, who's going to forget that play uh, against the Raiders, that that magic component that you can't really account for, you know, statistically. That's why they call him Fitz Magic, right? Mace, I know you're in the midst of a great series on the DNVR.com examining the Broncos quarterback options. So far, you've hit on Nick Foles, Marcus Mariota, Andy Dalton, and most recently, Tyrod Taylor. So do any of those guys really strike you as a better fit for the Broncos than, say, Ryan Fitzpatrick? Across the board, none of them do, although Tyrod Taylor, what he's got going for him is that he protects the ball better than almost any quarterback in football in recent years. He's not going to make mistakes. So if Vic Fangio and George Payton are thinking in terms of saying, all right, we led the league in giveaways last year. How do we remedy that if it's somebody different than Drew Locke? Tyrod Taylor would be that fit. The thing is, Tyrod Taylor isn't going to push the ball down the field. He's, go he's going to play a low-risk brand of football. So it's high floor but low ceiling type of play. A Andy Dalton, he's, he's a, a solid fit all around. You know what you're getting with him. We kind of saw it last year when he was in Dallas and he came in after Dak Prescott got got hurt you know that he can steady the ship he's not really a starter at this point in his career but he's just he stayed to come in and then Mariota 
He's got some upside. Maybe you're hoping he can be the Tannehill 2.0. Yep. And then Nick Foles, he's all over the place. As we saw in the Super Bowl run, his ceiling is very high, but his floor is really low. You, you don't know what you're going to get from him. So across the board, I think Fitzpatrick is a better fit than those guys, although Tyrod Taylor's specific skill set at protecting the ball is intriguing. Yeah, and I think that's what Drew Locke needs the most, right? We mm -hmm. can talk about his footwork, and he's working with the footwork specialist this offseason. Hopefully that's fixed. I've been talking to Locke about it for three years. Hope it would get fixed finally now, but it's those turnovers. And having mm -hmm. a Tyrod Taylor, that influence there. I talked to Bud Foster, former Virginia Tech defensive coordinator last week, and he talked about the professionalism, the way that Tyrod Taylor approaches this game. And I think that also would help Drew Locke as well. Mario is interesting to me. Because Titans insiders around the building say he wants to be great. And then, of course, with the Raiders, he didn't get his chance to be great. So uh, the guy took his benching well against the Broncos, by the way, and then now is looking for another opportunity to start. So it's a mixed bag, Nick, but I'll lean more towards Tyrod Taylor if the Broncos are going to go that veteran route, uh, not named Fitzpatrick. Well, I, you know, I didn't come on and just planning to agree with everything, but I Tyrod Taylor, to me, you look at the Broncos last year, worst turnover differential in the league. Um, you know, part of that is for two years now, they've had a real problem creating takeaways. Uh, but but the, the number of interceptions and, and specifically when Drew Locke went down, both backups for the Broncos, Jeff Driscoll and Brett Rippon, uh, continued to turn the ball over at, at a really high rate. And so to me, if you really are going with Drew Locke and believe that, that he's the guy you want a veteran to push him, but also understanding that if you bring that guy in, it has to be somebody that gives you a chance simply by not turning over the ball. I, I agree with Andrew. You're not going to necessarily get, um, you know, these these 350 yard games, three touchdowns sort of situations, but taking care of the ball to me is is such a pivotal thing for this team going into 2021. Well, honestly, we could talk about Tyrod Taylor, Andy Dalton, any of these veterans. But at the end of the day, the comment section on YouTube here from Broncos country is just going to say, sign Deshaun Watson. So if Deshaun Watson's trade request is granted, you guys, the Broncos, like a lot of teams, will be in on those conversations with the Texans. But if the Broncos sign Ryan Fitzpatrick, does that mean they're out on Watson? Definitely not. And really, they're not even out of the draft picture as well, even though I don't yep. expect them to take a quarterback in round one. But you have to get somebody right now, and then your options remain open. If if they get Deshaun Watson, if they're in that mix, then a lot of plans get blown up to accommodate for that. But uh, yeah, that does. If they sign Fitzpatrick or Taylor or somebody of that ilk, they are definitely not Alan Deshaun Watson, not by a long shot. All right, guys, while it seems like signing a proven veteran is the obvious move this offseason, we're going to discuss what surprises George Payton might have up his sleeve when it comes to the Broncos' ninth overall pick. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Broncos Beat. Alexis Perry here alongside Cecil Lammy, Andrew Mason, and Nick Kosmider. Guys, the NFL draft is still a couple of months away, but that won't stop us from speculating what the Broncos might do with their ninth overall selection. That's if they don't trade it away, of course. Cecil, late last week, you wrote a piece for DenverFan.com saying that the Broncos may have interest in a potential first round wide receiver such as Rondell Moore out of Purdue. So what leads you to believe that the Broncos would use another first round pick on a wide receiver? receiver when this team has so many other pressing needs right now. Yeah, the great thing about the draft is you have to be able to stick and move. You have to understand that the surprises may happen and you have to be ready because everyone is predicting an inside linebacker or a cornerback at nine. I've said corner at nine since January and I'm not going to change that if they keep nine. I always got to throw in something about Deshaun Watson every segment. But uh, when I look at who could be available and this wide receiver class is more talented at the top than last year's, it's not as deep. And remember, last year's was seen as the greatest wide receiver class of all time. More to me as a late first round pick, early second round pick, mainly because of seven games played over the last two years, but an explosive playmaker type of weapon and you know really a versatile player who can run jet sweeps in addition to those go routes that people love to see. And just you know, with this top heavy class at wide receiver, you think, okay, um, if there is a trade, are any of the current guys, you know, shipped off? Should the Broncos need a rookie wide receiver? Do they need more playmakers? I think it's always interesting. And when they have a Zoom call with a prospect, of course, going to write about it, going to report about it. But it's interesting to look at and see, like, well, what positions could surprise us? And, well, wide receiver certainly would be one of those. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that obviously we look at last year, the first two picks taken uh, from the Broncos were wide receivers. Uh, so it, it's hard to envision that for their first round pick, but Hey, what, what if Devonta Smith is sitting there at number nine because of all the, you know, machinations that teams were moving up to draft quarterbacks and the Broncos decided that wasn't the route that they wanted to take. So I agree with Cecil that it always has to be something that is, that is in your mind that you're potentially ready for, but, but that would register certainly, I think as, as a pretty massive surprise for the Broncos to draft a wide receiver at number nine. Yeah. It'd be a huge upset, but that being said, if you're the Broncos, you can't just look at guys that would be fits at nine. You need to look at guys who would be fits anywhere from pick 15 to pick 25, because trading down is a distinct possibility, especially if you're down to QB four or QB five by the time the ninth pick rolls around and you get teams that are sitting back there in the teens and twenties that need a long-term quarterback. They could get that itchy trigger finger and you might be able to net a first round pick in 2022 uh, for the privilege of moving down seven to 12 spots. And then once you move down, it really should become about best player available if at all possible. And Maybe the best player available is a wide receiver. Maybe that that is where the value is best. You have to think also about Cortland Sutton. He's in his contract year, and Tim Patrick is a restricted free agent. So you know, you all sorts of things come into play. I think if you move down, not just cornerback, or not just cornerback or linebacker. Reese, you mentioned Cortland Sutton. Cecil, mm-hmm. you kind of alluded to this. You know he might be a valuable trade asset for this team if they are looking to land Deshaun Watson. So is there a realistic chance that we might have already seen Cortland Sutton play in his final game as a Denver Bronco? Yeah, I hope not. I love Cortland Sutton, tip of the iceberg, right? And what we were Mm -hmm. supposed to see last year from Sutton, but you're right, Alexis. I mean, he is so valuable out there, so respected around the league in terms of what he can do. And when the Broncos draft Jerry Judy and then back it up with KJ Hamler, that's a clear sign like they're positioning themselves for a future that may not include Cortland Sutton. And that was last year. Now this year you have a chance to maybe get something for Cortland Sutton instead of just losing him in free agency after this season. It's something to keep an eye on. Again, I hope it doesn't happen, but it's something that's worth noting. Yeah. To me, it would be a a major upset just because, you know, we talk all the time about the, you know, Von Miller, Bradley Chubb duo of how we haven't fully gotten to see you know, them together outside of that 2018 season, which was, was, was a lot. They combined for 26 and a half sacks. And you're thinking, wow, what is this going to be in years to come? Um, you know, the same thing with Jerry Judy and Cortland Sutton didn't get to see that, but for one half of a game last season um, and Sutton had 66 yards on three catches, you know, he, he was already looking like he was ready to go. So it, it would be, I, I think uh, an upset to not be able to see those guys paired together next season. Yeah, I'd love to see them work together just because you want to get that look of him with Judy and Hamler. And also, I throw in Noah Fant as well, uh, getting him back to health and having Cortland Sutton out there. Then you start having the weapons that you plan to have at a level that you were going to have them. But looming all over this is that if you're planning on moving on from Cortland Sutton a year from now because of the younger guys that you have coming up behind him, then you let him go the most you're getting back is a third round compensatory pick, which is of course at the end of the third round. What if somebody comes in and says, Hey, we'll give you a two for Cortland Sutton today. If you've already made that plan that you might be moving on, you'd have to think long and hard about that deal that would get you more than if he just walked a year from now. The other part of it too, is if you're, if you end up going with Drew Locke and you're truly evaluating him and, and giving him this other chance to be, uh, a risk uh, to be the, the franchise quarterback of this team to take Cortland Sutton away from from him for a second year just doesn't seem like giving him the, tr- the true opportunity to be that guy. Well, there is no doubt whoever the Broncos take in the first round will have to come in and make an immediate impact. But who are some of the guys already on this roster that have the potential to splash onto the scene here in 2021? We'll tell you after the break. Welcome back for this final segment of Broncos Beat. Nick, you just wrote an awesome piece for The Athletic on Friday, listing the top 10 under-the-radar players that could be playmakers for this Broncos team this upcoming season. So what were some of the caveats that you use when compiling this list? Well, yeah, I think that you look at this time of year and everybody's talking about, you know, the big-name free agents, what they could get in the draft. 
But every year there's these back end of the roster players for every team that, that give themselves a chance to make an impact. And when you look at the Broncos, Shelby Harris, who is one of their most high profile free agents this year, started off in Denver as a futures contract signee. And these are guys who were on the practice squad the year before and are giving themselves now a chance um, to, to compete for spots or to compete for depth or whatever it might be. So I wanted to look at guys who were, you know, made, will make less than a million dollars next year who have not started a game for the Broncos. Um, you know, so you're talking about practice squad guys, guys that were in the seventh, seventh round picks uh, a year ago. And to me, there's some intriguing players on this team. And number one for me on this list is, is Tyree Cleveland. I, I thought in the week 17 game against the Raiders, four catches, 45 yards, but more than that, it was the way that he, I thought used his body to get in front of defensive backs really well, high pointed the football. Uh, he, he's a guy to me that, that is really intriguing going into this season. We mentioned, you know, Tim Patrick's restricted free agency, uh, Cortland Sutton's, um, you know, his contract. I think that, that Tyree Cleveland is a guy to watch, um, you know, a, as team activities get started this season. Yeah, I think it was perfect that you put Tyree at atop that list, Nick, because of what might happen at receiver in terms of what the Broncos might do. Do they move on from Patrick? Uh, what happens with Cortland Sutton in the future? Another guy that I really like that you put in there, you had Isaiah Mack, number three, of course. Uh, they bring him in. Um, he was with the Tennessee Titans. And the thing about him is he fits that template so well of, an, of a guy that the Broncos have had success with, especially on the defensive line. And they might not bring back Shelby Harris in free agency. He might go somewhere else. So there, there could be a spot on the defensive line that is wide open for someone like Mac to come in and seize this summer. There's a lot of support for Tyree Cleveland in that building for good reason and a very interesting list. I'll throw in some, some Derek Tuska love, Ryder, Levante <laughs> Bellamy, both players that I saw at the Shrine game. There's your uh, Broncos beat bingo, but let's do this. Everybody in Broncos country like, oh, this problem with this draft this is John Elway. Uh, Elway got you some really good depth, really good depth. For years, that's been a, really kind of a sterling hallmark of this front office so I want to give it up to John for being able to add these type of players that have that sort of uh, you know sparkle there's something there maybe a little bit more than some people think so it's a great list and right down my alley Nick great job because these are the type of players that you need your stars are gonna pretty much cancel each other out you need to have this quality depth these rising stars potential starters key players role players that's what the Broncos have on this list well, one person that just kind of fell off the list for me just because he was a fifth round pick. So I kind of see that as a little more visibility, but Justin Sternod, who injured his wrist in training camp last year, uh, they really like him as, as a potential coverage linebacker. Uh, so I'm really interested to see what he can do. We don't know how that linebacker position is going to go. Josie Jewell and Alexander Johnson kind of both did their thing last year, solid, but I, I think we can all agree. That's a position they're They're just looking for more for looking for, uh, different potential possibilities. So he's a guy to also really keep your eye on. Yeah, you got you got down the list. You had PJ Locke that you mentioned, and at safety, he's somebody you think long and hard about. Especially the depth really falls off after the starter, the starters, Justin Simmons and Kareem Jackson. And of course, Kareem has the option coming up, so you might have to tap into that depth. And uh, and Locke showed some flashes when uh, he was out there in practice. I'm going to go back to Levante Bellamy mainly because he looks a little bit like Philip Lindsay. Now, not as talented, whatever, and we'd love Philip Lindsay to stick around, but if he doesn't, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of teams that would be interested in Philip Lindsay, let's just say that on the restricted free agent market, Levante Bellamy is type that kind of clone, a, a smaller back who's not afraid to run inside has big playability is a better receiving weapon than some people give him credit for. I think that's the type of player, you know, those undrafted running backs for the Broncos for years have been making plays, whether it's a guy like Lindsey, guy like CJ Anderson, uh, Bellamy's a player to keep an eye on. Guys, really quick before we go, I want to follow up on something that Cecil said earlier when he gave that hat tip to John Elway. Is it safe to say that there is better depth on this team than some people may realize? 100%. And uh, part of that, I think, is, yeah, like Cecil said, you have to give credit to John Elway. And uh, the, the drafting philosophy did a little bit of a pivot back in 2018. Broncos focusing not exclusively, but more on guys who had exhausted their college eligibility, had team leadership, a lot of team captains brought in in that 2018 class. And you've seen better drafts across the board. And really, I mean, th this team it's still suffering a little bit from the lack of 
depth in their classes in the mid 2010s. But now you look around the roster and you see, okay, there are quality backup options instead of really being a top heavy roster. It's better across the board and uh, give credit to John Elway and the entire personnel staff for really changing uh, the template on the guys that they were looking at, bring in emphasizing character a little bit more. I think it's, it's resulted in better drafts. Yeah. I would just look at, you know, you look at the defensive line and obviously the Broncos weren't the same when Mike Purcell, Shelby Harris, Jarrell Casey. I mean, that's, that's just so much talent to have, to have missing games. But the fact that they were able to kind of still, you know, duct tape that line together and, and see guys like Draymond Jones and even Demarcus Walker, um, the 2017 second round pick who kind of finally started to feel it a little bit. Um, I, you just look at those positions and say, if, if they can have guys who can come in and, and really kind of help keep them afloat, that's the sort of thing that you're seeing that, that they've been able to continue to do the last couple of years. All right, guys, that is all the time we have for this week's edition of Broncos Viva. Be sure to follow all three of these guys on Twitter for some more great content. That's at Nick Cosmiter, at Mace Denver, and of course, at Cecil Lamy. We'll see you guys same time, same place next Monday.